Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. My name is Saurabh Sharma and we are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies course. So today is the fourth lecture called Schools of Ancient Chinese Thought. Now every civilization has certain ideas that are prevalent in, in, in that civilization. In China also, uh, there were certain ideas that emerged in the ancient times. The, the most productive period of Chinese history when most of these ideas emerged these philosophies emerged where two periods, first one was spring and autumn period, second one was the warring states period. Now the spring and autumn uh, period starts in 771 BCE. This was uh, when the Zhou dynasty was uh, nominally the ruler of, of, of China. In 771 what happened was the capital of the Zhou dynasty, Hao Qing, was attacked by a nomadic tribe, Chuan Rong, and they destroyed the capital and killed the king, Yo. As a result, the Cho had to shift their capital from, you know, Haoqing is somewhere here, if you look at the map, it's, it's around here, uh, it, it's in Xi'an today, and from here, they shifted the capital towards the east. Okay, so, so the period before 771 is called the uh, the Western Zhou period and uh, the period after 7, 771 is known as the Eastern Zhou period. And that is why uh, this, this, this actually year is, you know, uh, the beginning of the spring and autumn period. And the name spring and autumn comes from a famous work, spring and autumn annals, spring and autumn annals, which are uh, historical records of the state of Lu. You can see here in the east, there is a state of Lu here. Confucius belonged to that state. Uh, he, he served in that state for many years. And uh, so it's, it's a record of the entire history of this state beginning with 722 to 481 BCE. And it is supposedly compiled and edited by Confucius. Now what happened in the spring and autumn period? So in this period, the power of the Zhou dynasty began to decline more and more. It was already declining. It had to shift the capital because of its declining power uh, to, to make itself more secure. But gradually, the power eroded even further. And as you can see in this map here, number of small uh, states emerged out of the, emerged in China, nominally still under the Chou, but uh, they had their own regional autonomy. Okay, so it's full of different states. And because of that, these, these local rulers, they encouraged different scholars, they promoted different scholars from whom they took ideas and tried to introduce reforms in their own states. So, so, so it is a very vibrant period. So competition leads to vibrancy. A, 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 a society which is a, a bit too united, there is no opposition, there is no competition, everything is top down. Such a society uh, is, is less vibrant. The, the chances that that type of society will become stagnant. While a society where there is always a competition, warfare going on, uh, the rulers are unsure whether they will remain in power, you know, they have to be uh, the top of their game. They have to be always uh, prepared for any situation and they would, they would have to try to overcome their, their enemies. So that allows for development of new ideas. Okay, so, so that, that, that is the reason that spring and autumn period was quite a productive period. And in fact, uh, the next period, the Warring States period was even more uh, productive because uh, these uh, autonomous uh, rulers gradually created kingdoms of their own. So uh, some of them took the titles of kings. Earlier they, they, they had the title of dukes. Uh, that means nominally they were under the Chou king. But uh, now uh, s several states were formed. You can see these are the seven main states. By the year 260 BCE, we have these uh, seven states, Qin, Chao, Wei, Han, 
chu, qi, and yan. Okay, these are the seven states. Now, so how does warring states periods uh, begin? So, uh, different scholars uh, give different year for the beginning of this particular uh, period. I have taken the year given by Sima Qian, the author of Records of the Grand Historian. He gives the year 476 BCE as the beginning of the warring state period. And this is the year when King Yuan, he inaugurated his reign. Okay, so he was the 27th Chou King, he inaugurated his reign. Now, this period gets its name from another book called Strategies of the Warring States, which is a record of the diplomatic practices and military practices of the period. So, how each of what strategies each of these kingdoms, uh, you know, followed in order to become the hegemonic power. So, that is all recorded in, in this particular book, Strategies of the Warring States. And from there, this period gets the name, the Warring States period. An important event that, that, that begins uh, this period was, see, in, in, in between here, if you, if you look at the previous map, there this uh, kingdom of Qin, okay, this kingdom of Qin here, at the beginning of the warring state period, was, the kingdom of Qin was, was the strongest kingdom during Zhou dynasty, the, during the second half of the Zhou dynasty rule. As you can see here, by this time, the kingdom of Qin has been divided into three smaller kingdoms, Chao, Wei and Han. So, three smaller kingdoms emerged out of this um, uh, kingdom of Qin. Okay, so, 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 this is the warring states period. Now, let us look at the philosophy. So, this is kind of a brief background of, of the historical uh, you know, context in which uh, the different schools of thought emerged. Now, now let us talk about the ideas or the schools themselves. Now, there is a Chinese saying called Pai Hua Chi Fang, Pai Chia Chang Ming. It means Pai Hua Chi Fang means let 100 flowers bloom. Pai Chia Chang Ming means let 100 schools of thought contend. But this, this is a very famous saying in, in China. In, in the modern times, uh, the founder of the communist China, Mao Zedong, in 1956, he, he made it very famous by launching the 100 flowers movement. Okay, 100 flowers movement in 1956. So, his idea was just like during the warring states period, so many different hundreds of schools of thought emerged. So, uh, in, in the new China that he had founded or the communist party had founded, also should have a lot of vibrant ideas emerging. And so, he encouraged scholars to, to bring their ideas to public, write about them, publish them. In fact, he, he went on to say that you can even criticize the government, you criticize the Communist Party. Okay, he encouraged uh, uh, scholars to freely express their ideas. So, so, so basically, the, the, the goal was to ensure that the vibrancy that uh, the, the warring states period saw that, that, that uh, emerges in modern China also. But the criticisms was, uh, were, was too much for, the criticism was too much for Mao to handle. And the next year, 1957, he launched the anti-rightist campaign under, under Tang Xiaoping. Tang Xiaoping was given the charge. And all these um, scholars who had criticized Mao or Communist Party, or the government, or his policies, uh, all of them were persecuted. They were, they were arrested, they were sent to labor camps, so on and so forth. In fact, uh, Mao compares himself to Sri Wangti in this case. Sri Wangti supposedly have uh, buried 460 Confucian uh, scholars alive. So, Mao, Mao boasted that I am greater than Sri Wangti, because Sri Wangti buried only 460 scholars. While, while he had buried uh, more than 400,000, not literally of course, but uh, practically he ended their careers and uh, destroyed their lives. So, it's, it's uh, like burying them. Okay, so, so this is the concept of 100 schools of thought. Now, uh, the concept of schools of thought itself, so, so see that there are different philosophers who come and express their views. Okay, who become popular, were implemented, some do not become popular, so on and so forth. These things keep happening. But how do you categorize different philosophers into one group? So, so you can say, okay, these philosophers belong to this school of thought or uh, these others belong to some other school of thought. Okay, so that was first done by Sima, Sima Than. Sima Than, 
was the father of Sima Chan, who was the author of records of the grand historian. In fact, Sima Than had begun that work, but he died and so it was completed by his son in 91 BC. As I told you, this is the first systematic history book uh, written in China. Now, in this uh, book, there is an essay authored by Sima Than called Essential Points, Yao Chu, Essential Points, which for the first time introduces the concept of schools of thought and he identifies basically six schools of thought, six schools or uh, families, okay. The word used is chia, chia means family or home, okay. So, he categorizes certain philosophers. You can see uh, the, in, during this period, this Chou dynasty period, the later half of the Chou dynasty period, spring and autumn period, warring state periods, number of philosophers emerge. You can see in this map, the names of all these great philosophers that emerged during this period. What you will notice is the concentration of these philosophers is at a particular point uh, position in uh, geographically in China. Okay, this is along the Yellow River. The Yellow River flows here like this. So, most of these philosophers emerged at this. So, this was the core of Chinese civilization. On the other hand, if you see the Qin state or the Chu state, which are uh, geographically larger, but uh, not many philosophers have emerged in these uh, territories. Okay, so it was the Yellow River Valley, which was the core of Chinese civilization, core of uh, Chinese philosophy. Okay, so six schools of thought. Now, what are these six schools of thought? Now, according to Sima Than, there were six schools of thought in China. The first one is what he called Ru Chia or, or what we know as Confucianism, which was the more, which later on went on to become the most dominant school of thought. At the time of Sima Than, Confucianism had not yet become the uh, state-sponsored ideology. In, 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 because Sima Than, you remember, he belonged to the Han Dynasty period. And Han Dynasty actually made Confucianism as the official ideology of the, of the Chinese empire. But at that time, uh, it was the situation was still in flux. Confucianism had not yet a, assumed that particular role. In fact, Sima Than himself was more inclined towards Taoism than towards Confucianism. Okay, so, I will not go into his essay that he has written and he has uh, given his own views on different schools uh, because these are very brief and, and though they do not really get a, give us a complete picture of what these schools of thought were like. So, um, I will depend more on say the later texts and the later developments of these schools when they, they, they assumed a kind of a form that they have today. So, it took a many year, centuries for them to develop. So, I will try to present a kind of a complete form to you, uh, mentioning some important scholars who contributed to these different schools and the essential points of each of these schools. Uh, so, the first school, of course, is Confucianism, Ru Chia. So, Ru Chia means, Ru means scholars, okay, Chia means school, okay. So, school of scholars. So, these are Confucians were traditionalists. They studied the ancient classics, they preserved them, they followed Confucius, okay, and so they were known as school, uh, school of scholars. They were scholarly people who studied a lot, wrote a lot, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, the second uh, important school of thought is legalism. Legalism, which uh, Sima Than calls Fa Chia, Fa Chia or school of method. Fa means method, Fa means method. Now, what does it mean? It means that uh, this school emphasizes on not on the person but on the rules and regulations. That's why it's, it's called by the Western scholars as legalism because it, because it emphasizes on rules and regulations, rewards and punishments. Okay, so so it's it's methodological school. So school of method. Now this was a quite a popular uh, school. Um, uh, the first emperor Shi Wangti was a follower of the legalist school, and he used legalist methods to defeat all other uh, kingdoms during the warring state period. He defeated all other kingdoms and established the uh, Chinese empire under the Qin dynasty. Then the third important school of thought was Taoism okay, or Tao Chia. Tao Chia. So, Tao means way, the way, the path. Okay. So, so, this school basically focused on following a way of life which would lead to a kind of a higher form of reality. Internally, you achieve some kind of a higher form of reality 
by following this path. Okay, so that path is known as Tao. Now, I, I like to mention certain things that all these terms, say Fa, Tao, even Ru, they, all, all the schools use them. It's not that uh, a, Confu a Confucian will say Tao is, is, is the wrong thing. So, but according to Confucians, ta the interpretation of Tao will be different than the interpretation of the Taoist. For the Confucians, Tao is something external. It is related with heaven, Thian. Thian is the most important concept in Confucianism. So, Tao has to be following the way of, of Thian. It's more external in nature. While for a Taoist, it's more about internal development, internal realization. I, when I go in, into uh, these schools, I'll, I'll explain in more details. Let's move on. Uh, so, these three schools have, have uh, remained relevant in Chinese history for a very long time. And even now you can say these, some of these ideas are prevalent. So, Confucianism is still uh, uh, very much researched in China and many, many Chinese scholars you know, suggest uh, different ideas based on Confucianism. Legalism is also very popular because legalism is considered to be very modern in a sense and, 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 and so a lot of scholars work on legalism. Now, Taoism remains popular uh, in popular culture. Taoism is one of the recognized religions in China. So, among these schools of thought, only Taoism is, is designated as a religion in China. Okay, so it's, it's followed by large number of people, millions of people in China and also Overseas Chinese uh, follow Taoism and Taoism is also popular among say some western new age uh, people who, who like to uh, follow some of these ideas. Okay, so these three schools are very much in existent, uh, existence right now. The other uh, schools are not so much in existence independently. The fourth one is Moism. Now this school is known as Moism because it was started by Mo. Okay, so it is known as Moism. Master Mo or Mo Tzu. Okay, his school is known as Moism or Mo Chia. I will discuss his ideas when I come to it. Uh, let, me, let me mention all the other schools. The fifth, the fifth is In and Yang Chia. In and Yang is an ancient uh, Chinese doctrine. If you, if you refer to the first lecture, I told this uh, myth of Pan Ku. Okay, Fan, uh, Fan Ku was the first uh, being that emerged in, the, in this universe according to Chinese myth. Okay, so Fan Ku was born out of this egg, okay, which, which, which consisted of yin and yang. And, and out of that, Fan Ku was born. So, so, yin is the feminine principle and yang is the masculine principle. Okay, so, so uh, yin turns into the earth and yang turns into the sky and the sky moves higher and higher and earth becomes thicker and thicker. Okay, so it, in 18,000 years, finally uh, the earth as we know it and, and the sky that we know comes into form. Okay, so that was the story. And every, every as, I, as I told you, every civilization had such kind of stories. In India also, I told you in, in the Vedas, there is the concept of Hiranyagarva. Okay, so out of which uh, the, everything is born. Finally, the last uh, school, the sixth school is school of names, Ming Chia, school of names. Now, uh, some of some scholars have uh, mentioned this, this particular school. Uh, for example, Joseph Needham considers this school to be a very important school uh, 